Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Solis, and I'm going to talk to you today about an ancient prophecy written around 590 B.C. that foretells that the Lord will supernaturally intervene to defend the nation of Israel and work in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces. It's a prophecy that's on my radar screen. I think it could happen in the near future, perhaps even in the church age. Now, I'm not alluding to the Gog of Magog War in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, a prophecy of which many of you might be familiar with. You see a map up on the screen of the ancient names that Ezekiel wrote about, and, and a group of invaders are going to come in the latter days and invade Israel for plunder and booty. And alongside, you see the modern-day equivalents who the consensus among the scholars might include Russia as the lead player in this coalition, bringing with them Turkey, Iran, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, perhaps even Morocco, and Germany. Now, as you can see, this is a formidable advance of very powerful nations coming to invade Israel, and the Israeli Defense Forces will not be able to stop them, nor will the American troops be involved in this war, because God himself will stop these invaders supernaturally. And we find that out in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 19 through 23. And it's going to start with a great earthquake. Now, when this great earthquake happens, it says every man's sword will be against his brother. In other words, the advancing troops from different countries speaking different languages will panic and they will start to kill each other. And then it says there'll be pestilence and bloodshed, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. It'll be clear that this is a supernatural victory handled by the God of the Jews. And it's a very important prophecy because it's the prophecy of Mark event of the end times in which God is going to put the world on official notice that he is the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promise-keeping God of Jesus Christ. And here's what it says after that supernatural defeat. Ezekiel 39.7 tells us, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Now, I had stated that the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, will not be involved in the fighting of Ezekiel 38 and 39. However, the IDF is involved in numerous biblical prophecies, prophetic wars, that I believe happened before the tribulation. They're pre-tribulation wars. You see a list of them. IDF versus Syria versus Hezbollah and Lebanon, Palestinians, etc. Uh, I do believe this, these prophecies will find fulfillment before the tribulation and perhaps even in the church age, depending on when the rapture happens. We point out in the DVD called The Pre-Tribulation Prophecies that Tom Hughes and I put together a prophetic documentary why these wars are pre-tribulation wars because the Israeli Defense Forces are not fighting in the tribulation, nor are they fighting in the millennium. Now presently, as I air this program, Israel is increasingly concerned about Iran's nuclear and missile threats. In fact, in May of 2022, Israel conducted one of the largest military drills in their history called the Chariots of Fire. And it was intended to fight a war against Iran and a multi-front war against Iran's proxies, which would include Hezbollah in Lebanon, Syria, Hamas in the Gaza, uh, the Houthis down in Yemen, Shi Shiite militias in Iraq, just to name a few. In fact, Iran also came out in November of 2022 and boldly claim that they have a missile, a hypersonic missile, that can reach Israel in 400 seconds, which is 6.66 minutes. Now, this type of missile can carry a nuclear warhead and travel five times the speed of sound. Also, Iran came out shortly thereafter and said, we have an underground air base from which they can launch their, uh, send their jets and their ballistic missiles within those jets at Israel. So as you can see, Israel is very concerned about the mounting threat that Iran possesses, and Iran does want to wipe Israel off of the map. I'm going to show you a video clip that Iran prepared for what it has in store for Israel with its portable rocket launchers and its underground missile silos pointed at Israel with missiles that can get there in 400 seconds. Now that video clip, as well as the one 
audio drama clip that I'm about to show you, as well as all the other slides throughout the remainder of this presentation, have all been taken from my Future War Prophecies DVD. You can see the list of some of the prophecies, the wars covered in the DVD, and also in the book that goes with it. Uh, the war between Israel and Syria, the proxy war, the Psalm 83, final Arab Israeli war, Ezekiel 38, we talked about briefly at the beginning of this show, the seal judgment wars, the trumpet wars, the fifth and sixth trumpets, the war in heaven between Michael the Archangel and Satan, uh, the final campaign of Armageddon, the battle, go through 11 stages on that. So it's a great DVD and book for you to have in your library. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Peter Grant. We're breaking into your regularly scheduled programming to bring you this important news alert. War has broken out in the Middle East between Israel and its neighbors. I repeat, Israel is at war with several of the nations that surround it, including Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. We have a correspondent, Olivia Markell, who is standing by live in Tel Aviv. Olivia, what can you tell us about the situation at this hour? Peter, we have reports that the Israelis are fighting on several war fronts, even as we speak. The Israeli news reports that the initial conflict began early this morning when missiles were launched from Syria and southern Lebanon into Israel. Hezbollah, the terrorist organization, is being blamed. However, Al Jazeera TV is stating that the Israelis were first to strike inside Syria, instigating the exchange. In any event, we do have confirmation that at least two missiles landing in Israel contain chemical warheads. I repeat, chemical warheads. That audio clip you just saw came from an audio drama called The Coming Global Transformation. It's a collaborative work I was able to do with Jim Tetlow and Brad Myers. Matter of fact, I invite you to uh, go online, Google search The Coming Global Transformation. You'll find right at the top that you can actually listen to the audio drama online for free, the 22 different scenes, which covers not only the Middle East wars like the clip you just heard, but also gets into UFO deception, uh, the Harlot World Religion, and much, much more. So I encourage you, Google search The Coming Global Transformation and be benefited by this wonderful audio drama. Now, The Coming Global Transformation is also available on Kindle on Amazon for free, so you can read the script in its entirety. And it's also available as a CD for an audio version as you're driving in your car if you want to listen to the 22 scenes as well. Now, that audio drama, the conflict involved Hezbollah and Syria in a confrontation with Israel, but it also included Jordan. And some of you might be thinking, well, would Jordan really be involved? They have a peace treaty with Israel, and presently, of course, they do. However, Scripture informs us that that peace treaty is temporary at best. I'm going to show you three prophecies involving Jordan in a confrontation with Israel, whereby that peace treaty is non-existent. We're going to start with the first one in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 2 which says, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites. Now that is Northern Jordan, Amman Jordan is where the capital is. And it says, it shall be a desolate mound and her villages shall be burned with fire and Israel shall take possession of his inheritance, says the Lord. So this involves Israel at a war with Jordan, Amman Jordan, the capital becomes a desolate mound and Israel takes possession of his inheritance regarding the promised land. Genesis 15, 18 tells us that Jordan is part of the promised land because that promised land includes land between the river of Egypt, probably the Nile, and of course is all the way through to the river Euphrates, which is in Syria and Iraq. So that's Northern Jordan we see here is gonna be affected in a war with Israel winning and taking possession of its territory. We're gonna look at another camera angle of that war and show that it also involves Central Jordan, which is Moab. So we have Ammon, Northern Jordan, and Moab, Central Jordan. And here's what Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 says. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people, that would be the Jews, and made arrogant threats against their borders, that would be the borders of Israel. And for that, here's what's going to happen to Ammon and Jordan and Moab. The residue of my people shall plunder them. That would be the Israeli defense forces. And the remnant of my people shall possess them. So we see again another confrontation involving not only Ammon, but also Moab 
and Israel being victorious and possessing that territory over there. Let's also look at southern Jordan. We've covered northern and central Jordan and Ammon and Moab. What about Edom, which is southern Jordan? Here's a prophecy, and all these have been unfulfilled. Do your homework, but you'll see. All three of these prophecies I'm showing you have been unfulfilled. We find out in Ezekiel 25, verses 13 to 14. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom, that's southern Jordan, and cut off man and beast from it and make it desolate from Taman, which would be Edom area. Dedan shall fall by the sword. Now that takes us, Dedan is in northern Saudi Arabia, so it involves Saudi Arabia as well in this prophecy who they get involved. He goes, Dedan shall fall, fall by the sword and I will lay my vengeance on Edom. I put the tents of Edom and I'll show you why shortly. By the hand of my people Israel, again, the Israeli defense forces are involved, that they may do in Edom, southern Jordan, according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord God. So we see northern, central, and we also see southern Jordan in Edom. Now, you can see by their ancient names, Ammon was northern Jordan, Moab was central Jordan, Edom was southern Jordan. Now, Jordan temporary, temporarily has control over the Temple Mount through the Waq Antiquity Society. And every time there's a ch talk about changing the status quo on the Temple Mount, Jordan goes into an uproar. But at some point in time after Israel wins this war, it's highly likely that Jordan will no longer have control over the Temple Mount. So at the onset of this video, I mentioned that the Lord will supernaturally intervene to defend the nation of Israel and work in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces, and that that was not concerning the Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophecy in which the Lord does also intervene. I'm talking about an entirely different prophecy in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. A time will come where the people round about, the Arab enemies of Israel that share common borders with Israel in the neighborhood, where they will come and attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. And the Lord will make that a cup of trembling to those nations, like a form of dizziness or intoxication in some translations. And that'll be a major mistake on their part, and we'll see why. So I would turn our attention now to Zechariah chapter 12, verse two. At some point in time, Jerusalem is gonna become a cup of trembling. It says, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, or dizziness in some translations, unto who? Unto all the people round about. And when they lay siege, it shall be when they lay siege against both Judah and against Jerusalem. Okay, something that's, when they do that, it's gonna become a cup of trembling to them, okay? And that, I believe that's gonna happen real soon. And it has not happened just yet. The countries are round about, not the whole world. We'll try to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. We just took a look at Zechariah 12, verse 2, and it talked about the nations round about, not the international community at large, but the Arab states sharing borders with Israel. They will someday attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. And they'll find out that that is a huge mistake because the Lord will intervene and turn it into a cup of trembling to those nations. But what would the international community's position be around that time frame when that event is taking place? We go to Zechariah 12, verse 3 to find out. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away or impose a burden upon it will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered or assembled against it. Now, I like to read the American Standard Version translation of that same verse. It says, And shall come to pass in that day that I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all the peoples. All the burden themselves with it shall be sorely wounded, and all the nations of earth shall be gathered together against it. Now, many commentators believe that that particular verse, this verse, Zechariah 12, 3, finds fulfillment in relationship with the end of time at the Armageddon campaign. Here's one example from the Bible Knowledge Commentary of the Old Testament by John F. Wolverd. And here's what he says about Zechariah 12, verse 3. That day, alluding to Zechariah 12, 3, refers to the future battle, or better, the campaign of Armageddon, in which the nations of the armies will gather together at Jerusalem. So here's how I translate that verse, though. It, basically, I believe that when Israel's surrounding Arab neighbors attempt to besiege and to falsely and forcibly possess Jerusalem in that day, 
the international community will attempt to intervene and impose a burden upon the city. Zechariah warns that this is a bad idea because the burden will boomerang back to sorely wound or cut to pieces those nations. Now we see in modern day application, we look at America involved in, as a member of the international community and dealing with the Palestinian and Israeli peace talks, trying to meddle with that position. And Jerusalem, of course, uh, the Palestinians want to have control over East Jerusalem and our presidents. You see Clinton in 2000, George W. Bush around 2006 to 2009, John Kerry under the Obama administration in 2013, all meddling and trying to intervene on the status of Jerusalem and the peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians. We also see that the, take it back in time, the United Nations in the November 29, 1947, Resolution 181, also called the Partition Plan, when they were gonna make Israel a nation again, they were gonna have a problem with Jerusalem and they were gonna call it an international zone. So we find back at the partition plan, even back then, the international community was meddling about the status of Jerusalem. Then in 1948, of course, Israel became a nation, but Jerusalem was considered an international zone. Now, the Arab states around Israel, the ones we're talking about that will someday lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, uh, they all voted against their being in Israel. And then they, when Israel became a reality in 1948, they came together in a war. Now the Arabs lost that war and as a result, we had a phenomena hit the scene called the Palestinian refugees. You see a picture there of some of these Palestinian refugees back in 1948 and 1949 in their tent communities. I believe the Bible alludes to them as the tents of Edom. Tents of in the Bible can mean refugee conditions or military encampments. And they show up in Bible prophecy. Now the Edomites, ancient Edomites have ethnical representation in the Palestinians today. Now, not all Palestinians have Edomite descent, but we can certainly trace their lineage of the Edomites into the Palestinians. Now, they show up in a prophecy in Psalm 83. In verses 6 to 8, it identifies by their ancient names. It starts off with the tents of Edom in the lead role. And the Israelites, Moab, the Hagarines, you see their names up there by their ancient names. I'll show you a map of their modern day equivalents in just a moment. And what they, they were going to form a confederacy and they're going to want to destroy Israel. And their goal, it says in Psalm 83, verse 12, is that they want to take for themselves the pastures of God. They want the promised land for their possession. So in a summary, what you have is these countries here, tents of Eden, the Palestinians, uh, you have inhabitants of Tyre, Lebanon, you see Syria. These are all the countries round about Israel that will someday lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. A summary of the prophecy, Psalm 83, 4 says they come together and they said, let's cut off Israel from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. And you see the, the list of the belligerents on the right identified in their modern day names. And the goal of this prophecy, as I understand it, is they don't want a two-state solution. They want a one-state solution. They want to take over the land of Israel for the tents of Edom and have another Arab state called Palestine. Now these refugees or number in the millions, and they're not just stuck in the land of Israel per se, but you see they're up there in the West Bank, which is also where Judea is. Judea and Samaria are the biblical heartland of the, encompassing the West Bank. And so you see you got a lot of the refugees in the West Bank. Of course, you got the Hamas and the Gaza over there, but you see those little red dots. These are refugees scattered throughout the whole Middle East, and they're struggling to have a homeland again because the Arab countries are not assimilating them into their countries. So also as a result of that war, not only did you get the Palestinian refugee crisis, the tents of Edom, but the international community continued to meddle and they attempted to divide the city of Jerusalem with the armistice agreements in 1949. Now this is, was just mean a line of demarcation. It was never meant to be permanent and it didn't last very long. We'll show you in a moment. But you can see the international community is still meddling. Jerusalem was an international zone. Now it becomes a divided city, which the Bible never called for Jerusalem to be a divided city. That's all man-made. Didn't last very long because you had the Six-Day War in June of 1967, and Israel won that war in six days, and they took over the entire city of Jerusalem, came under Israel's control at that point in time. 
However, they granted control of the Temple Mount to Jordan at that point in time, which was a colossal mistake. Now we're going to find out how the Lord makes Jerusalem a cup of trembling to the Arab countries when they try to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. And we're going to draw our attention to Zechariah 12, verses 4 through 6. In Zechariah 12, verses 4, we find out that the Lord supernaturally intervenes on behalf of Israel to level the playing field against the Arab armies that are advancing that vastly outnumber the Jewish state. And when the Lord intervenes, we find out in Zechariah 12, verse 5, that the Israeli defense forces become emboldened and emboldened to such a point that they win a decisive victory against those Arab armies in Zechariah 12, verse 6. But before we do that, I've got a couple of slides I want to show you that help explain what's going on to get to that stage of Zechariah 12, verses 4 through 6. We take a look back at Psalm 83, Asaph, verses 9 through 12. When Asaph petitions the Lord on how he would like him to deal with the Arab confederacy that wants to wipe Israel off of the map. And what he says, deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook of Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, yes, their princes like Zibon and Zalmunna, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastors of God for possession. What he's talking about there is he's drawing our attention back to the book of Judges, chapters 4 through 8. And at that time, in Judges chapter 6 to 8, you had Gideon, who warred against the Midianites, who had oppressed the Jews for seven years. And Gideon, with his 200-man army and the help of the tribe of Ephraim, killed 120,000 Midianites. Uh, he, they killed Ziba and Zalmunna, the kings, and Orban and Zeb, the princes. And when that battle was over, and the Lord helped them miraculously to win, when that battle was over, the Midianites never again oppressed the Jewish people. And then we go to Judges chapters 4 and 5. We have Deborah, and she's dealing with the Canaanites at that period of time who had oppressed the Jewish people for 20 years. And their king was Jabin, and his general was Sisera. And so Deborah was told to get her general Barak and go defeat them. And, and they also won that war, and the Canaanites never again oppressed the Jewish people. So what we have is Asaph is petitioning the Lord to deal in those, that precedent, help the Israeli defense forces empower them, to get rid of the kings, the princes, the infantry, the leaders, and everyone, so that the, the Arab Confederacy can no longer oppress the Jewish state. And of course, we see that the Arab countries have oppressed the Jewish state since 1948, wars in 1967, 1973, and Israel surrounded by enemies even today. Asaph goes on to say in verses 13 through 15, make them like whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, like stubble, like burning wood, like a blazing mountain fire, like the tempest before the storm. In other words, he's saying to the Lord, help them win this war decisively and reduce the Arab Confederacy into never oppressing the Jews again, like the images of whirling dust, chaff before the wind, etc. So now let's see how the Lord is going to make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to the Arab states around them, around Israel, who's going to attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem. Zechariah goes on to say there's going to be some divine intervention when this happens. He lays out three segments of what the Lord's going to do. In that day, when Jerusalem comes a cup of trembling, to all the nations round about, the surrounding countries, who happen to be, I believe, Psalm 83, I will strike every horse with confusion and its riders with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah. I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So remember when Zechariah wrote, they rode horses. Uh, I don't think the Arabs are going to be coming against Jerusalem on horseback. So we have to put this into a modern day vernacular and equivalent. So what he says, the first thing is going to happen when this happens and they lay siege on Jews in Jerusalem. First, it appears the Lord will cause the Arab artilleries, tanks and armored vehicles to malfunction. I will strike every horse with confusion. Now there's historical biblical precedent for this. We go back to the Red Sea, the exodus of the Hebrews out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 30, 34 through 35, this is a, the Hebrews got their backs against the Red Sea. The Egyptian army and Pharaoh are barreling down against them. The Lord puts his cloud in between them to protect them. And here's what happens before they come after the Jews in the Red Sea parts. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar and fire of, and the cloud. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians and he took off their chariot wheels 
So they drove, without, drove them with difficulty. Now the Hebrews didn't sneak around and do that. The Lord went in and he took off the lug nuts. Now the Egyptian, the Egyptian chariots were world famous. They were the most state-of-the-art Egyptian chariots at that time. So he levels the playing field. He takes off the lug nuts and says, the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel. The Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So hopefully some of the Egyptians fled. We just don't know. But of course, Pharaoh comes in with you know missing chariot wheels and stuff into the Red Sea. The Red Sea parts, the Hebrews go through and Pharaoh's armies go in there and the Red Sea's collapse on them and that ends that war. So we have historical precedent of malfunctioning going on. In that case, charity, chariots. The next thing it goes on to talk about in Zechariah 12 verse 4b, I will strike every horse with confusion, the malfunctions, and when that happens, the riders will go, go mad, they'll be filled with madness. So basically, second, these malfunctions apparently create hysteria among the enemy soldiers like it did with the Egyptians and its riders with madness. So this is going to panic the Arab countries. Okay? Now we have an example. Remember I told you Asaph petitioned the Lord to deal with them like Gideon did with the Midianites? So let's look at that account here, the madness that happened when the Lord intervened on that. We look at Judges 7, verses 20 through 22. Then the three companies of the 300 men of Gideon blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that they had, held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. So they had torches, trumpets, and pitchers. 300 men against 120,000 Midianites. Not advisable in most wars. <laughs> but Lord, so Gideon, this is how we're going to do it. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place around all the camp. They lit their torches up inside the pitchers. They, sh they shouted their trumpets out and shouted the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And the whole Midianite army of 120,000 ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord said, every Midianite's man soared against his companion. So the whole camp and the panic-stricken Midianites were army fled to Beth Acacia towards Zerah and the border of Abel Malah of Tabath. So this, the Lord supernaturally intervened. They went mad. So after the artillery's malfunction and the Arab armies, this, now these are my interpretations, but the, the, the Arab soldiers go mad. You know? Like we have this example here. Then it goes on to the third stage. When the malfunctions happen and the soldiers go mad, uh, the Lord will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So the Lord will turn his favor, third, will turn his favor toward the IDF, and somehow the guidance, radar capabilities of the enemy's tanks, jets, rockets, etc., will become disabled, and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. So, okay, that's one way to level the playing field, right? Malfunctions on the artillery, madness on the soldiers, guidance and radar systems that don't work. I could be entirely wrong, but that's how I'm interpreting this prophecy. It's in relationship to the day that the Arabs come against the people round about against to lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. The fourth thing that happens is the Israeli soldiers are emboldened when they see this intervention happen. It says in Zechariah 12.5, And the governors of Judah, read that as the captains of the Israeli defense forces, shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength and the Lord of hosts, their God. So fourth, the Israeli defense forces will become emboldened as battle to battle as they witness the enemy's equipment malfunction and the Arab, Arab armies panic. They will gain courage as they focus on their fight to regain soul sovereignty over Jerusalem, which has come under siege, Judah and Jerusalem. Then it goes on to say how this will conclude after the playing field has been leveled, the battlefield. Zechariah 12, 6 says, and in that day, again, we're talking about when they lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem and all those divine interventions from the Lord has happened. I will make the governors, the Israeli defense forces, if you will, of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Yes, Jerusalem. So we have a picture imagery of a fire pan as a battlefield. The Israeli Defense Forces represent a fiery torch. The surrounding peoples represent sheaves. We know who will win that war. And they will devour them on the right hand and on the left hand. So we have to ask ourselves the question, the peoples roundabout, 
are there people round about on the right hand and the left hand that are gonna that have claims they feel they want to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, which they will do? And I say, yes, there are, and they're not in Ezekiel 38. They're in Psalm 83. So Zechariah 12 is not found fulfillment yet. Zechariah 12 through 6 there that we just talked about. So in conclusion, a day draws near where the Arab states around Israel are going to attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, a final attempt. And when that happens, the Lord will make Jerusalem like a cup of trembling to those Arab states. He will also supernaturally intervene to level the playing field against the Arab armies versus the Israeli Defense Forces. The Israeli Defense Forces will be emboldened when they see that happen, and they will win a decisive victory, a final victory, on the Arab enemies to the right hand and the left hand. They will devour them and defeat them. And when that happens, it will fulfill a prophecy in Ezekiel 28 that talks about the Lord executing judgment upon the Arabs around them. And here's what it says. This says, the Lord, when I have gathered the house of Israel from among the peoples whom they are scattered, and am hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land which I gave to my servant Jacob. And they will dwell safely, and they will build houses, and they will plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely. When I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them, then they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. This is coming. This day draws near. We may see it happen during the church age, and if we do, how will that affect you and your walk with the Lord? Will you be able to evangelize and give a defense for your faith, knowing this prophecy beforehand is about to happen? I hope so, and thank you so much for watching.